I always liked making things, and I always built model kits, and, and I would make models from scratch out of cardboard or anything I can get my hands on. Growing up Asian in America, actually, I saw Larry Tan, Izo Young, and Greg Jean were these three Asian model makers, and it just kind of opened my mind to the idea that, like, okay, yeah, I can do this. That was a life changer. So Von, tell us how you got started in the industry, because I know you're a legendary model maker in the field and you've worked on so much classic IP and seminal films. My name is Fawn Davis and I do miniature special effects for motion pictures and television. Yeah, how did you get started? When I was a kid, I really just always, I, I saw people doing model making and things like that in movies. I kind of set my sights on doing exactly that. But I had moved to San Francisco on my way to Los Angeles and I was just kind of stopping there to make some money so I could afford to go to college. And when I was there, I discovered there was a film industry there. So being based then in the Bay Area ultimately meant you were able to move into industrial light and magic, which yeah. I imagine at the time was like the definitive model shop to be in. It was in the early 90s. Industrial Light and Magic was doing 70% of the visual effects work in the industry. It drew people from all over the world to work there. My first project there was a Global Olympic Village miniature because they wanted to show the completed Global Olympic Village, but it didn't exist yet. So we had to create it with visual effects. You know, after proving yourself on commercial work, you started to move into features. Yeah. Um, and you were on the, the Star Wars prequels at the time yeah. we were in Ireland. Yeah, we, we actually started with the uh, Star Wars special editions. The special editions were really a test to kind of see if, you know, if there was a fan base for Star Wars. And obviously it was a huge success. For me, it was kind of like this weird form of time travel <laughs> because I grew up on on the Star Wars movies and then especially when we worked on the special editions, I found it very interesting that I was working on the very same movies that inspired me when I was young. So tell us about the process. What are you getting? What kind of direction are you getting from George? H how did that process work to birth um, a model? For Star Wars specifically, it was uh, George Lucas and Doug Chang at the at Skywalker Ranch was a separate facility. And they did a lot of pre-production before they would come to Industrial Light and Magic. So they would kind of work out everything with their art department. You know, we would get animatics, we would get blueprints, we would get, you know, sometimes computer models and things like that to build from. Sometimes you get a napkin <laughs> with a sketch or, or a post-it note. Those are pretty common. Part of the fun though is when you didn't get all the information because that meant you got to fill in the blanks. So tell us what we're looking at here, Fon. What's this piece? The story behind it is it's an enemy spacecraft in a proof of concept we we're doing for a director friend. This is a good example, I feel like, of use of greebles versus um, custom parts and just how much a design can rely on greebles. The little detail bits are basically the greebles and greeblies. The term greeble came from, as far as we know, uh, from a model shop in Van Nuys that worked on the original Star Wars movie that later became the ILM model shop in Northern California. So this one utilizes a lot of greebles. There's a piece of a fuselage in here in an airplane that kind of acts as the basis for this conning tower. And then we also have this whole trench on the side and we filled that with detail. And the reason we have this trench right through the middle of this ship is because we always need to gain access to the inside of these miniatures when we shoot them. So we hide the seam sometimes in something like that. Because what's fascinating is that this language that we see on so many ships and in so many buildings from you know future cities and science fiction this actually comes from some of the necessities of how you make miniature models being able yeah. to get inside it you want a certain amount of symmetry a certain amount of asymmetry you think about all of those things when you're doing something like this you know we want this to feel like a very very large craft if it was all one singular piece it wouldn't feel very big but when you break it up into sections or panels then it feels like it's got a greater scale to it.
We're here because kit bashing is a, is, is a critical part of the way you work as a model maker. Tell us about kit bashing. You know, when you're building a model and you need to add a lot of high frequency detail, you know, it would take a long time to manufacture each one of those components from scratch. So often we'll just rob parts from model kits and use them in ways that they weren't intended to. You know, so we're always thinking about what is the visual storytelling of that model while we're adding the greebles. Like a 2013 Mustang, and then there's like World War II stuff, there's a Gundam model. When you use it out of context, the goal is for it to not look like the original component. So we'll avoid things like, we'll use a lot of parts from a car engine, but we won't use the transmission. So this, this was actually, this the Leopold railgun has lots of really great parts. This is one of the most popular model kits for the Star Wars model makers. You might actually even be able to spot if you're super keen on combing through the books what where some of these parts have been used. So, so somewhere on a on a Star Wars model, there there definitely is a yeah. piece of of the of the Leopold railgun. Oh, absolutely! Yeah, that was a very popular one. Interesting thing is sometimes we'll we'll greeble uh, a model kit or we'll we'll combine certain greebles and make a new greeble <laughs> and then we make molds and casts and it's it has its life just starting out of one of these random boxes you know so there's, there's kit bashing and there's scratch building yeah right mm -hmm. there's definitely times where we have to take raw materials and just make parts from scratch in fact the bulk of a model is that and that's why we use the greebles and the detail is wherever we can uh, we have a saying off the shelf is always cheaper so you you use as many off the shelf items as you can for your build. So you have whatever budget is left to do some really, really choice custom parts. So we're seeing here some original models. They've been kit bashed and then they've been scanned and used in different ways. Tell us the story of these pieces. Part of this production has been to use as a test bed for different methods of virtual production and how to acquire digital assets utilizing what we know in traditional art. These three designs are all made 100% from kit bashing. There were no sketches, there was just a vague idea of what we wanted them to be. We created the model and then we brought those in through photogrammetry or, or laser scanning and photography. So essentially what you're working with ultimately is digital models generated from this kit bashing process. Yes. That then became digital assets as backdrops to, to actors against the LED wall. Exactly, yeah. The goal with these was to find the most rapid way to bring digital assets into Unreal. But other parts of the movie, these would be considered non-hero kind of background craft for more important scenes in the movie, like the hero spacecrafts, then we went with the more traditional design process. So for these, we start with thumbnail sketches, and then we do a refined piece of artwork, and then we 3D printed all the parts, painted all the parts, and then we use the photographs of those parts for the texturing of the original computer model that we created. You know, with a lot of miniatures, especially for a movie like this, the entire process is the design process. Another great thing about model makers and, and people in your industry is that when you're not working on big IP and, and big films for, for famous directors or big franchises, you're keeping busy making your own personal projects and we're inside the space of, of one of those projects. Can you tell us a bit about what we're sitting in? It's been repurposed as a spaceship set uh, currently, <laughs> but this, this started its life as the inside of a giant robot. Part of the aesthetic of this was actually borrowing from reality. So a lot of the things that you see here are um, you know based on Black Hawk helicopters and tanks and current military technology or where it's kind of headed in the next 10 years. Being a fan of giant robot science fiction growing up, I wanted to see something that was more gritty, more realistic. No one had ever done anything like that. I had realized, you know, I do this stuff for a living. Maybe I should just do that story since I hadn't seen it. And that's kind of where that came from. And more of is now a graphic novel? Yeah, yeah. First thing we did was a graphic novel. So this is the outside of the cockpit that we were sitting in earlier. This is a MORAV, which stands for Multi-Operational Robotic Armored Vehicle. Sometimes when miniatures get this big, we call them bigatures because it 
feels kind of silly to call them miniature. <laughs> uh, but this is one six scale, so you know a person would be about a foot tall. This is fabricated from sheets of Sintra, which is a really lightweight plastic. On the inside of this, it's all backed with a layer of fiberglass, just a real thin layer to keep it lightweight. Because this, this is actually designed to put someone in and they articulate the legs. But then the, the aesthetic here is very noticeably contemporary, real world military. This is very much grounded in an aesthetic that we would recognize today. Just like the cockpit, I did a lot of uh, research into current military technology where it's gonna be in five or 10 years, ground it in our reality and that would make it more believable as a, a design. We know that it's not some alien distant planet that's totally unfamiliar. We know it's not a thousand years in the future. Exactly. All of those design cues help us to understand the world that this story takes place. And it, what's amazing is that like here we can see a big part of the craft is trying to make these t entirely fictional and imaginary worlds feel grounded and feel believable, right? So I, I imagine that you thought through each one of these switches and lights and that you can trace them through and imagine what it would have been like to sit there at the helm of one of these giant mecha and that kind of narrative and storytelling and role playing crystallizes in the setup of some dials. Uh, one of the things that I really wanted to do with the uh, world building of Morav was really, really grounding it in our reality. So you can imagine, you know, why would we have giant robots? Uh, how would they function? How would they manufacture them? I guess just pretending I'm actually in that world really helps define the aesthetic of the, the project for sure. Yeah, I think it's my favorite room in the building. Um, we have a lot of books. You know, uh, Google is not great for everything. You know, you draw inspiration from a lot of different things. So in a way, a lot of those real world references is, is also, I think, what helps science fiction to become relevant, not just fantasy. Right. right? And one a great example of that is Starship Troopers, which is really about contemporary politics and propaganda. This is a spaceship that you that you built. Tell us about the story. Um, this one's actually an aircraft carrier. Every once in a while, you get lucky enough on a project that you can get permission from your supervisor to have access to the mold. This is a really good example of a scratch-built model. This didn't rely on a lot of kit bashing because there were multiple studios working on this movie and there were multiple scales of this same design. And every studio was shooting in different scales, so we all had to have the same exact design. So everything on here had to be built from scratch. So this is probably about 40 different pieces. This is an original creation based on those parts. I mean, it's undeniably Starship Troopers, I oh, guess, yeah. because you, you're able to connect to that visual language that's set up through the rules of the sure. universe. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So this character needs no introduction. Tell us the story of this particular piece. There were a number of us that worked in the ILM model shop during the uh, special editions and the prequels that we just really loved this design. We'd always really enjoyed it. There was about 10 of us. We decided we were gonna build our own, which was a very ambitious project. This is so iconically Star Wars. Can you go into a bit more of the world rules? Like even just the, the way that the panel lines start to work and not having rounded corners, but having sharp edges. Star Wars uh, is a used galaxy, you know, so everything in it looks like it's been outside or it's, it's you know, it's been, it's seen some things, you know? <laughs> uh, in Star Trek, it's very, everything is very clean, kind of more of a utopian organized system. So what, what is it about R2-D2 that you think lends itself to, to the fascination, the, the army of builders that, that are making their own? Like, why are we connecting with this character? I've never thought about what that connection is, but I definitely have it. I think that there's something to be said for leaving things to your imagination. Like, you never really know what R2-D2 is saying. You can kind of project a lot of yourself or a lot of what you think he is like based on your imagination. But there's a lot of R2-D2 which confounds the imagination. That yeah. makes absolutely no sense if you were to really build a robot like this. And yeah. And perhaps part of that is what gives it its charm. Yeah, a there's a lot about it that's not practical. It's like you see how the design is practical after seeing it in use, but it's definitely not something you would come up with on your own. Even for the prequels, 
From the outside, a lot of us think that one of the big transitions that happened from the original three to the prequels was that everything went digital and there was huge amounts of green screen and visual effects, but I think there was actually more models made for the prequels than, than, than there yeah. was almost for the original. Yeah, each one of the prequels had more miniatures in the individual film than all three of the original Star Wars movies combined. The cutting edge technology was all computer graphics at the time, so a lot of the focus was on that. That being the focus in the press, a lot of people thought we didn't do any miniatures at all. Uh, it was actually quite the opposite. I feel like for a lot of artists, it is easier to work in physical space and get things right, you know, the physics of an object. Because you've gone all the way through the industry from in the heady days when everything was physical models and miniatures. Yeah. Now, the new incarnation of that, which is virtual production, all this craft and this amazing skills and and stories that we've been talking through, has that ever been in danger of vanishing? There's a, a common misconception that uh, we stopped making models around the time of the prequels, actually. Um, but we've never stopped working. But there's still always been a place for miniatures. And, and you said it with, um, you know, hybrid visual effects. I think hybrid visual effects has been a big part of the industry for a long time. As the new technologies come out, we're still tapping into all the traditional filmmaking departments and arts. We still have art departments, we still have costume departments, we still have miniature departments. Those all play a really important role in production regardless what the technology is that we utilize to complete the movie. So much of what we think of as the aesthetics of science fiction comes from you folks and, and the way that you make models and the choices you're making in fabrication that, that often doesn't come from concept artists or directors, but comes when you're in the shop, mm -hmm. on the saw, putting stuff together. Yeah. Big part of what we think of as contemporary science fiction is down to model makers. Yeah. You know, when it came to the finer details and the, um, there was a lot of creative freedom that we were given. But we, you know, we were always very conscious of the designer's goal and what they, what they were trying to project and we did have those conversations. And there was always a, a very specific aesthetic that we, we had to immerse ourselves in to achieve the look for each one of these designs. We used to sit in the break room at lunch and draw on pieces of paper. We would do three shapes and you'd hold it up and people in the room would have to guess whether it was Star Trek or Star Wars. <laughs> with the idea of these aesthetics being so, you know, like, I guess the themes being so well defined. World building is a huge part of what we do and probably the most enjoyable part of what we do. A big part of that world building isn't just making stuff for the screen. I think what's amazing about science fiction is it also creates the capacity for us to imagine what our futures might be. So there's oh, yeah. a really a direct relationship between the aesthetics of science fiction and science fiction world building and someone sitting there watching that going, I wanna be in that world, I wanna make that thing that I'm seeing on the screen, right? Yeah, uh, the doctor that invented laser surgery said that he had been inspired by the idea of uh, lightsabers in Star Wars. Just the fact that it would cauterize the wound as it cut it. iPads are very similar to the pads that they have in Star Trek Next Generation. You know, the list goes on and on and on. You know, people are definitely inspired by uh, the work that's done in science fiction movies and the kind of predictions of the future. On a Friday night, we can disappear into these universes with some popcorn and tune it out. But at the same time, the layers of detail and the thought that goes into building these consistent worlds, is just immense yeah. and, oh, yeah. and is, is really intelligent and really strategic in terms of both how it connects to an audience, how it tells a story, but how science fiction can also be a, an amazing tool to help us relate to the world that we live in.